the human experience. Inside the humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu I'm going to preface this by repeating something I've said quite a bit this summer, which is I've always had this fantasy, or I've long had this fantasy, of filling in for Charlie Rose. <laughs> so I want to thank Ellen Woods for making my dream come true. <laughs> and, uh, and the first thing I have to say is um, we've, we corresponded a little bit as we started talking about this panel. So last night was the first time that I met Eric and Mark in person, um, but I didn't realize you two have never met in person either before then. We met last night for the first time. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I want to start by uh, getting some background information about the two of you, kind of in helping you know, introduce and set the stage for how this collaboration came to happen. Um, Mark, can you tell me a little bit about your background? Where did you do your graduate work? And when, did you, when were you with the IHEM program? It was, um, I came here in 2001. I was here till 2003, and uh, the, I came here from uh, Michigan State University, uh, so my dissertation was turned in by my advisor as I was driving out here, uh -huh. so it was an immediate from the, from the, uh, the, dissert, from the uh, doctoral program directly here. And before that, and I, I did uh, my field in uh, Roman history uh, and uh, Hellenistic mm -hmm. history as well, and then I uh, did an MA at uh, the University of South Carolina in uh, late antiquity. So that's the, um, and so pretty much came here right after, right during the completion of my degree. Yeah. So. Wow, and how many years were you with IHEM? Two years, two, two years. years, yes. Okay. Uh, so left before the third year, regretfully in a lot of ways, but uh, I was a talking a bit. Uh, it's hard yeah. to leave, but when opportunity knocks, right. right? How about you, Eric? I was here the very first year, 97, 98. And I still remember getting the letter for, yeah, it was a letter, it wasn't an email, from Ian Morris when we were in Greece. My wife was leading the summer session at the American School. Mm -hmm. And we got the notice from Ian saying, come on home at the end of the summer and come on out to California. And we were jumping around screaming. We were so excited that they thought something had gone wrong in our apartment. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, so it was absolutely wonderful. My background, um, I actually grew up in California, mm -hmm. um, did undergrad at Dartmouth, master's at Yale, PhD at Penn in ancient history, mm -hmm. and my whole uh, specialty is contacts in the ancient world, mostly between Western and Eastern Mediterranean, so I actually fit perfectly into the course that Ian Morris was teaching at the time, uh, which then became ancient empires. Mm -hmm. So, but coming here, we see this as uh, the big break. I had been adjuncting since 91. I, in fact, in 97, before I got here, I gave a paper at a conference called Seven Years in the Life of an Adjunct, <laughs> in which I, <laughs> I it's just put all my woes out there one after the other. The time, I, time I was teaching at uh, six universities in one semester and earning less than $20,000 and called myself a Rhodes Scholar because I was on the road all the time. <laughs> But coming here, I was, we were only here for one year because um, Diane, my wife, had uh, a position at Cincinnati and she took a leave of absence to come out here with me. So we were only here for one year, went back to Cincinnati and soon thereafter I got the first job offer I'd ever gotten at GW and went off and it's now been 11 years and I'm the chair of the department, the head of the institute and basically everything I knew I could do but nobody was giving me a shot to do it came true because I suddenly had teaching at Stanford on my resume, and they figured I must be okay. Yeah. So this, we say that IHOM was my big break, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned Ian Morris, um, and I know he played a role in the serendipity of you writing together, but how did working with Ian Morris impact your experience in IHOM? I'll, I'll just say that Ian sends his regret today. He's in Hong Kong, so um, <laughs> he did really uh, want to be here. And um, I'll, I'll start out and then uh, you could uh, jump in. But um, I think what uh, Ian inspired me immediately, I didn't know it at the time, but he was uh, using uh, the IHUM experience to kind of think through some of the ideas mm -hmm. for the book, which has recently come out, uh, Why the West Rules for Now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's very rare 
uh, in, uh, among ancient historians in the circles that I worked in uh, to ask such huge questions. Um, you know, how does the ancient world relate to now? And not just to take this in terms of Western traditions, not just look at it in a very focused uh, sense that way. And so he was asking questions about uh, inequality across, uh, you know, across space and time, modern versus ancient, and finding the roots in the ancient world. And I had never seen an ancient historian working at that level, raising those types of questions. And uh, so his lectures, I mean, uh, as we were talking a little bit last night, uh, we both try very hard to uh, kind of emulate him in a lot of ways because uh, just the students on the on the edge of their seats and the you know how many hundreds in the in the uh, the larger lecture halls, um, and uh, just uh, and not just you know we can say the cliches of a passion and knowledge and all that, but uh, just those those type of huge questions that ancient historians just find ridiculous to ask, and he was asking them and having great fun with them, and the students just loved it, and so that's that's what I've taken away from that teaching is to try to you know, just, just raise those, uh, some of the big questions as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with you know, kind of current teaching. Yeah. yeah. It was the same for me. I mean, when I got here, Ian was teaching basically ancient world course at the mm -hmm. time. And I remember saying to him, somebody really needs to write a textbook for this course. <laughs> <laughs> Lo and behold, who knew later we would yeah. do it. But um, I too used, uh, still use Ian as a role model, absolutely. And, the way he could come in twice a week for 50 minutes and just, like you said, mesmerize the students. And now I find myself in my classrooms, and my classes will range from 15 students to 138. I've got right now into it archaeology, 138 students. And finally, I have two TAs for the first time <laughs> who are running their own discussion section. So I get to be in. I get to come in twice a week for 75 minutes and yeah. entertain and then leave the rest of it to the TA. Yeah. So I'm like, finally, I'm in. Oh my God, it's only taken 10 years. But everything that I, I used here, and I, I we'll get to other things we taught. I mean, part of the iHome experience was teaching stuff I had never studied, yeah. which was a real growing experience. But um, to be here and to be with one of the people who's still cutting edge and with this How the West Was Run, it shows that he was thinking of those huge topics even way back when. Yeah. So um, just very much a learning experience for, I think, both of us. You say you've got um, two TAs now. Do you, do you find that your relationship with the people you are teaching with, with these graduate students or yes, lectures? Do you find that your relationship with Ian or the way that you worked with Ian or the way you worked at IHUM informs? Yeah, uh, even though it's been more than 10 years since I was in their position, sure, I still remember that. And the way that I was treated in IHUM yeah. is the way I treat them. They're, you know, they're real people yeah. and with talents and you try and make use of them. Yeah, yeah just through, I mean, I don't have graduate students, but uh, I'll, say, I'll say that uh, from day one, just to, to piggyback on this, that. Uh, Ian's sense of collegiality within the group was also something that we all very much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, there was no, um, you know, it was, it was not uh, down, talking down. We just all shared ideas and had a great time in our meetings. So, yeah. But it was more than that, too. I mean, the whole iHome group, I mean, I remember the people, Carlos, we were there together in the first year, you know, and, and others, I can see you in the audience. It's just absolutely wonderful, and some of us have stayed in touch, and it's been a, a bonding experience. Uh, two years ago, somebody came walking down the hall at GW and said, hey, how you doing? I'm like, good, who are you? He says, you don't know me, but I was IHUM six years after you. I'm like, oh my God, let's go to lunch. You know, and so there's been this camaraderie, a group within a group, and even the ancient historians. Yeah. We know most of the people that came after us, Petra and Rebecca and Emma and Rob, and, mm -hmm. and like, it's kind of handing on the torch to, you know, oh, you worked with Ian, and then you worked with the other Ian, and then right. you, know, yeah. so. Yeah, so it's, it's been uh, an experience for a generation now. That's great. Um, so I'm curious, aside from ancient empires, what other IHUM courses did you teach? I did uh, Finding Voices, Forging Selves. I don't know that anyone else in here taught the same time I did with um, uh, Hester and uh, Herbie. Uh, and um, so, uh, yeah, so I did, did that one for uh, one of the, uh, the terms. And um, I guess in there, really learned how to, how to teach text that I've talked with several of you about just last night, the Opuleus, the Golden Ass. Mm -hmm. Really, I mean, one of the most easiest texts to teach, and at the same time, one of the most hard, the difficult uh, texts to teach. And we had a great time in there. And I, I have no, I, I was also teaching Virginia Woolf to the Lighthouse, uh, which, what a, you know, what a wonderful stretch for yeah. an ancient historian. I mean, the T.S. Eliot in there I could deal with, but 
Uh, the Virginia Wolf, that was, of course, as we all know, these things stretch us uh, quite a bit. And the other one was um, the uh, Origins Contested Identities. And again, I don't, I don't see anyone who taught the, at the same time with the other Ian, Ian Hodder mm -hmm. and, um, and Michael Shanks. And uh, I think one of the things that, one of my best memories from that course was just the, the way that uh, both of them as lecturers were complete opposites. I mean, Ian Hodder would come in uh, with the old-fashioned projector. Uh, this is, I mean, not, not refusing to use PowerPoint. I don't know what he does now. Somebody could uh, uh, light me on this. But the old projector where he would literally have the sheet of paper and handwritten you know, and going down like this and would talk in a, in a very low tone. Uh, people uh, who uh, had, know his work are actually sometimes shocked, shocked. by the, the, the difference between uh, kind of Ian on, uh, on paper and then as the, as the lecture. But uh, in spite of all of that, again, the students absolutely mesmerized uh, by his lectures. Uh, so he's uh, often uh, reading his notes, but the students just, just, just hung on every word. Then Michael Shanks, on the other hand, who, of course, gave a lecture, every lecture he gave, had to have uh, um, PowerPoint <laughs> movies going on behind him as he spoke. And I mean, a, a complete theater in the yeah. best possible sense of the term. Total opposites, but, uh, but very effective ways of communicating. And I, I'd love to get into this now with um, discussions that probably happen at a lot of colleges. Uh, you know, the Luddites versus the technology people or whatever. And, and it just seems to me so ridiculous that it, at one level that I've seen both uh, work so well. The people who are just really not into using the technology constantly and those who do and use it very effectively. So uh, both of them as, as real teachers uh, and communicating, which have far transcended any of the media they were using or the approach they were taking. And so uh, also one other thing I'll just show you with Origins. Origins um, actually helped me get my first job, though I didn't know it at the time. I, I learned this uh, several years later that uh, a dean in my, uh, the college I'm at, uh, Grove City College, was wanting to put together a, uh, an interdisciplinary origins course, which brought together natural scientists and, uh, and philosophers and theologians and historians and got together and discussed uh, some of these types of issues. They didn't tell me this at the time because the dean had it in his mind and it wasn't getting too far with several other uh, constituents, we'll say, in the, in the college. Um, and then as soon as I got there, they, they say, okay, well, you, you taught this class origins. Would you like to do this? And I said, no. <laughs> I do not want to teach that. Uh, and so then they asked me for several more years, no. And then finally they said, well, would you like to teach this course in January in the Galapagos Islands? It was a great experience. I love teaching the course. <laughs> and I'll teach it every other January now. So uh, one of these, yeah. <laughs> in terms of what I taught, since I was only here one year, I only had a chance to teach one other. And to be perfectly honest, I couldn't remember what it was. I remember what I taught, but I couldn't remember the name of it. And so I'm glad you have the old course catalogs there, because I went over this morning. And look, great works. Great yeah. works. <laughs> like, ah, how could I forget that? Yeah. And with Sherry in charge of it. And now I remember teaching Toni Morris's Beloved, which now for an ancient historian, that's a stretch. Yeah. But I got so much out of it. It was absolutely amazing. And that was perhaps the highlight of that fall career or the fall quarter for me. And I remember sitting out with the students outside one day mm -hmm. and just going around talking about it. And that, for me, epitomized the whole experience. I mean, for one thing, Stanford students, as I tell mine today, Stanford students are the brightest I've ever taught. But to be out there in the sunshine in this gorgeous weather to be talking about Beloved and evoking the imagery and trying to really get at the nuances was just absolutely amazing. And that was, you know, within my first couple of weeks here. I hadn't even gotten to my ancient empires bit. So it was absolutely amazing. Delicious. You both mentioned the schools that you're currently teaching at. Um, you're at Grove City College, as I've mentioned, which is a small school. Right. I had two cousins who attended Grove City. And you're at George Washington. Can you tell me um, a little bit about where you're teaching, sure. what your students are like, what your institution is like, and how I am prepared you for that? Sure, yeah, the um, Grove City College is about uh, 50 miles uh, north of Pittsburgh, a small uh, liberal arts school, about 2,500 students. And actually, one of the comments I was going to make in the, uh, our discussion this morning, which uh, maybe we can come back to some of that as well, is actually my best students in my required humanities course are the engineers. And I'm not just talking performance. I'm talking across the board and really embracing the material. So I have a very different type of experience uh, with that because, uh, and in many cases, they follow up to take Iliad and the Odyssey independent studies with me. So I have a, a different type of, maybe the small liberal arts college might have some a different type of situation than, than, uh, than some of you might have had uh, with that. It's a, uh, the school I teach at is, is loosely affiliated with the Presbyterian Church, um, a USA. Uh, so it is a, but uh, there's no uh, faith statement of faculty or students. 
Uh, so it, it does certainly, it, but it does have a uh, so it's something a bit more of, a, of an evangelical flavor, perhaps, to the to, among the student body that doesn't go across the board. But I'd say, you know, compared to, to some liberal arts schools, you might have that. And um, so it, it's, I mean, our biggest challenge right now it, at, as an institution, and listening to Andy, I was, I was kind of shocked by some of the, the challenges you're facing as well. But I mean, for us, when I got there, our, um, our acceptance rate of students was about 30%. Now it's at about 60%. So over the course, you know, this is we're, but a selective school. And um, I have about 120 to 150 students uh, per semester, uh, four different courses. Uh, thankfully, I had, again, IHUM. I just, uh, these are my crib notes, uh, some of these uh, the lectures there. So about 120 to 150, 60 students uh, per semester. And, uh, but um, generally speaking, uh, very hardworking, often uh, very uh, kind of engaged, smart students. And I, I, I do enjoy it there. Uh, there's, of course, the, the ups and downs of everywhere, and I'm on, on film, so I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just, I'll, 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 give you the, I'll give you something of the whitewashed version yeah. of uh, what it's like teaching in a small liberal arts college. But um, that's uh, been my experience so far. I get to know the students really well, and um, so. Excellent. How about you? Well, winding up at GW after having taught at, I think, 11 different other institutions <laughs> was nice. One of the things that I found out that is that most of the students are, are students, no matter where they are. They've got the same problems, they've got the same pressures, as we mentioned this morning. Uh, GW, I feel very much at home. Not only are my colleagues very good, but I was actually born there. Mm -hmm. Literally, I was born at GW Hospital. <laughs> oh, and that's, that's actually nice. how I, kn yeah. I knew I got the job. I went and I gave my job talk, and as they said, and here's Eric Klein coming here from Cincinnati. And I said, thank you very much, it's nice to be back. And they all looked at me because they had never met me before, and I said, 40 years ago, I was born across the street, and they started laughing, and I thought, I've got this job. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough, it happened. So I'm very much right at home there. But um, also, it, it's very good for someone who's come out of IHOM and, in, and an interdisciplinary background. Because my department, where I'm, I'm now the, the chair of it, we teach not only ancient history, uh, but also some archaeology, but uh, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Arabic, Persian, and Turkish. So the name of the department has been changed a couple of times, and I was able just now to change it again last year. We're now the Department of Classical and Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, which for me epitomizes exactly what I do, but also what I think everyone should do in the ancient world, where you're not just a classics department, you're just not just a Near East department. And of course, we stole the name from Harvard and UCLA and Chicago and such, which have Near Eastern languages and civilizations. We just yeah. added classics there as well. Uh, and it's been very rewarding to watch things grow. I'll give you one example. I'm the archaeology advisor. And when they asked me a year after I got there, back in 2001, would I be the advisor? I said, well, I don't know how many majors are there in archaeology. And they said, there's eight. And I said, eight per year? They said, no, eight. <laughs> this is in a school that admits 2,500 people per year. I'm like, OK, eight majors, that's fine. We now have between 15 and 20 per year. So you can make tremendous strides just using what you've learned at IHOM and, and everywhere else. So it's not necessarily me. It's anybody else could now step into that position uh, and, and teach them. So with the proper training, it's possible. So I'm having a grand old time there, needless to say. Excellent. So you're at different institutions. You did not teach at IHOM together. You did not meet in the physical world until last night. How did you come to write a book together? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'll, yeah, that's. Uh, I'll go. I'll take a stab at that. Started yeah. that. It's a um, year or two after I left here. Mm -hmm. I uh, approached Ian uh, Morris uh, with the idea of turning the ancient empires class into a textbook. Uh, there's a whole series of reasons I want to do that. We might come back to. And uh, so, um, approached him with the idea, and uh, he was enthusiastic about it from the, the start. Uh, so gave uh, full permission to, to go uh, to go full steam ahead with that. And um, then I uh, went to, I approached uh, Cambridge uh, with, a, um, with a proposal. And uh, they immediately said they liked the idea. You know, the, the large questions this is raising, there's a real need for this uh, in, uh, in, uh, you know, among the uh, in, uh, in colleges that uh, have ancient world classes. A lot of people complain about not having a textbook that they like that raises the type of questions. Um, but they said, uh, you know, a textbook like this, uh, we want to have, we'd like to have a team working on this. This is, you, you know, I'm a Roman historian, late Roman historian specifically. We want a team working on this. So I went back to Ian and told him about this. And immediately he said, Eric. 
He said, no doubt about this. He said, Eric Klein is, uh, is who you're going to want to work with on this. He said, he's, he'll bring in the Bronze Age. He'll bring in all, you know, he'll bring up every area and expertise up to where yours really starts in a, in a real defensible way. And so I, um, I sent, just sent an email out of the blue to Eric. Uh, I, can, I have all these, by the way. I read them over a little bit, too, in refreshing for this. But uh, uh, so just said, you, know, you don't know who I am. Uh, I just mentioned the name Ian Morris and Ihum. He got back and said, I've got several other projects I'm working on right now. I Give me some time. And I think it took maybe, an, uh, maybe about uh, another day. It was about 12 hours later. He's back saying, yes, uh, this looks like a great idea. He had done, he'll talk about this in a bit, I'm sure, but he had done collaborative work before. I had not. Uh, so had a very clear idea in his mind about what types of things are involved in this. We sent the uh, proposal back to, to Cambridge. And uh, this is, yep, this is exactly what we want. Uh, and so it just took off from there. And uh, we've had se several times I've been in the D.C. area in the summer and uh, wanted to meet Eric. So I would write him an email and he'd say, I'd love to, love to meet up, uh, but I'm going to be in Israel excavating yeah. for the summer. So that's so it's kind of been a pattern over several summers. So we've, we've made the effort. Uh, we both made the effort in that way. But um, it was a, certainly a, a very a delightful last night just to kind of meet somebody who you've been <laughs> kind of really yeah, working on a project together collectively for, so, for, for quite some time. But that's my, that's my side of things. But. Yeah. Well, it was funny, too, because I had to Google Mark before I got here to make sure I recognized him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. It yeah. worked. Yeah, your picture does you justice. Yeah. Um, what Mark doesn't realize is that in the intervening 12 hours, when I, was, I had contacted Ian and said, Ian, I think you need to write this with Mark. Yeah. And Ian had written back and said, no, I already told him that you would do it. Yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to double check with Ian that, yeah. that he wouldn't be the one. Of course, he was busy. Now we know on his own projects. Yeah. And so once I had the green light from Ian to say yes to this, then I got back and said yes. And we were off and running with Ian's blessing. And uh, if any of you take a look at the book, then we're indebted to any number of iHomers that helped us out with chapters of either before we started writing or during. And so the dedication is, correct me if I'm wrong, yep. That out. To our great. dedicated to our families, to our students, past, present, and future, and to the whole IHOM gang. Because this is a whole IHOM project. It's kind of like getting up for the Oscars saying, I couldn't have done this without the team. <laughs> That's pretty much, we couldn't have done it without the team. Yeah. So anyway, it was very interesting working long distance. And Mark is going to be. Uh, modest here, but the whole project was Mark's idea. And Mark did 90% of the work. He did all the writing, he did all the research. Uh, when I joined, it was mostly just to fine tune and to edit and to make sure that the Near Eastern part that I knew about was correct. So um, it's all his, basically. I came in at the, not at the last moment, I and mean, we did, we put the project together, but I regard this as Mark's book that I helped out on if you want to put it that way. And it's only through marketing at Cambridge, who I got really annoyed at, that my name's on first. It should be his name that's on first, absolutely. It's all of his. But this is where you run up against marketing for the big presses, is they have their own idea as to what, I and mean, we didn't pick the cover photo. I'm not sure Actually, that. The only thing we did say is don't use something Roman. Right. And, and for those of you, <laughs> it's Roman. If you get more Roman than that. <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> they picked the cover photo. They basically picked the title, the final result. Mm -hmm. uh, they picked the order of the authors. Um, I mean, it was pretty much out of our hands in a way, which was rather unique for me. But the collaboration process could not have been easier. I mean, I'll write a book with you again any day. Yeah. <laughs> you can be my wingman yeah. any day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've done a number of other collaborative projects also. But most of them, I'm face to face with the people. They're my co-directors of the excavations. This, um, but this is not the only time I've written a book not having met the person. In fact, this is the second time. Mm -hmm. The other one, I've now written two books with her and have yet to meet her. <laughs> but in that case, it's rather interesting because she's a children's author. And I was first put together with her when Oxford was putting together the World in Ancient Times series. Mm -hmm. And she and I did Ancient Egypt together. And what I did was feed her the facts and she then wrote it for young adults, for sixth graders, in fact. And the whole idea was to aim it at California and Texas. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah. we got along so well, and I thought she did such a good job that afterwards she said, what else should we do? Mm -hmm. I said, well, we need to do a book on Troy. 
She's like, great, we'll do the Trojan War. And she pitched it to all of her contacts. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, we wrote a little young adults book uh, called Digging for Troy, which came out last year. Wonderful little book. She did most of it. I, did, I fed her the facts and all that. And again, I've never met her. So, and at this point, I'm a little afraid to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if we don't get along? I mean, fortunately, yeah. Mark and I seem to be getting along. Yeah, but yeah, anyway, so this, I think, is what's going to happen more and more. This is the internet age. Mm -hmm. you know, this, and These connections. The connection and the speed. Yeah. I mean, we would go back and forth on a chapter in under a week, back and forth and back and forth. Previously, there'd be letters that would take six months to go back and forth with right. thinking and this. And so I think we're actually going to see more of this. And it, it works. It's easy. Yeah. You know? And now you can Skype. You can email. You can do you know, instant video messaging, whatever you can. So I think it's just going to get more. I want to go back to the, the book you mentioned. Um, as you were making this connection to start your collaboration, both of you had reached out to Ian Morris, and he kind of backed away from the project and, and put, helped bring the two of you together. And of course, we know now that Ian Morris was writing his own book, um, which is also based on ancient empires. And the third time that I taught ancient empires, and I, we talked about this a little bit last night, I was in Ian's office, and I saw the box of his book. And I said, how come we're not using your book for the class? And he's like, I don't want to use my book for the class. So my next question for you is, how is, what, um, what sort of, what was the reasoning that went into deciding to write a textbook for this kind of course? And how is writing a book, or how is composing this book, which is essentially a textbook, based on teaching a class different from writing a book which is sort of based on a long period of cumulative research into a period and into historical trajectories? I'll say, I think it's different at, at every level. Mm -hmm. Not just the kind of proposal. And by the way, if anyone's interested, I did bring copies of our initial proposal to Cambridge. It's not often that you see what a proposal looks like for a textbook. And it, it's not the same format as you getting a, a monograph published. So mm -hmm. if anyone would like to see that, um, I've, I've got uh, some, some copies up here. But um, I think one of the things that we're, we're trying to accomplish in this is it's a very untextbooky textbook. Okay. Uh, if I if I could, it, and so yeah. it's um, drawing on the kind of the large questions that IHUM raises, which is our starting point here. Um, it's not really a monograph. It's not really a textbook. But there is there's a strong theme and argument going through the whole thing. And so if I, I would love to see it uh, starting maybe something of a of a um, of a, of a paradigm shift toward this type of writing, because I found that students actually engage with this a heck of a lot better uh, than they do the, you know, the, the huge textbook, uh, which is trying to be comprehensive, the type of thing that you hate assigning in classes, the things your students hate you assigning in classes. In large classes, uh, you feel you have to sometimes because you don't want to go into all the details. Of the, you know, and and so, um, in, from, so from the get-go, I think we, we wanted this to be something which is going to be used in classes which is quite literally taking the IHUM experience and the questions, the type of questions raised here, and putting it out in a, in a larger setting. Uh, so um, I, I don't think that uh, there was really any other uh, genre that we could work with in other than textbook, but it's not really a textbook. So that's, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's several differences we might uh, uh, come to along those lines as well. Um, and uh, so is that, that's, yeah, I don't know if you want to jump in at this point. Yeah, I, I was reading it again on the airplane coming here, and I got about four chapters in, and I went, you know, this is pretty good. <laughs> this will make a very good textbook. Yeah. And uh, it will not only make a good textbook, I figured, for an introductory course on the ancient world, which I have taught before, uh, but also for upper-level seminars, because you can come at it at a couple different levels. But it's not just throwing facts at the students like they did in Western Civ when I had to teach it 38 times in five years. This is throwing facts at them with a purpose. Right? It's going, each chapter begins with three or four questions that we're asking them to think about while they're reading it, but it's also, as Mark said, it's thematic. It's the IEMP mm -hmm. uh, going through where there's a, there's a theme to the whole book, uh, and you're, you're looking at it uh, as, as a way to investigating the past and asking and answering specific questions and seeing if there's a cycle, if there's a rise and fall, and exactly what's going on. So there's a method to the madness. You're not, you're not just learning the facts to regurgitate them on a test. You are learning them so you can actually answer questions. But also, as, as I say, and this is an answer to those saying, why should we study history? Why should we study humanities? 
because you want to be an educated citizen of the world, right? You need to know what Socrates said and what he thought. You need to know what Plato did or you're not going to understand. People get up on the floor of the Senate every year and quote the ancient authors. And if you don't know them, you're not that educated. Now, that's, not, that's neither here nor there. It doesn't mean you can't go into business and make millions. But to be an educated citizen of the world, you do need these. This is why humanities is important. Right? And I think that this textbook is one way to get towards that. There's a reason for it. And some of the key themes we're exploring in here are definitions of freedom, mm -hmm. order, justice. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we, uh, I think, it, one of the most enjoy enjoyable parts of the whole project is, is, is we kind of imagining how students are going to engage with these type of large questions completely in a completely different way than polarized political discussions they're used to. Mm -hmm. It opens up the, the frame of the discussion, uh, I would say, quite, quite, uh, quite broadly. And uh, so that was what we pitched to the marketers as well, that this, this is going to have students talking about justice, uh, order, and freedom more so than, you know, who is Asher Banipal? Uh, you know, that's going to be there. We, we, like you said, that these things have to be there. We're gonna, that, that's in there as well. Well, that's actually um, pretty fascinating right there, but yeah. <laughs> Very fast. Yes, right. You say and all three of us lean forward yes, right. just a little bit. Yes. Exactly. But to, to talk about what Ashurbanipal did in the context of what did it mean <laughs> for freedom and justice and all that. <laughs> Ashurbanipal, the Neo, Neo Assyrian uh, uh, king, way back when. <laughs> right. Um, so it seems to me that the, the practice, I guess, the, what I hear you talking about, the sort of argumentation and the sort of nuance, um, it feels discussion section-y to me. Can you tell us a little bit about connecting the experience of teaching with the, connect, with the practice of writing something together? What do you think is the key to harmoniously collaborating that way? Or teaching? Let me, I mean, one thing I want to, I'll respond to the, the, the yeah, first sure. um, part here. This is, uh, Several weeks back, the, the marketers, just before this came out, the marketers from Cambridge contacted us and uh, about a 45-minute discussion you know, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, how we're going to pitch this book, who is it going to go to. It's very different from you know, monograph publishing, you know, to, to talk with the whole marketing team. And uh, to your first point about this, this feels discussion mm -hmm. section. They said, well, you know, most of the time that an ancient world class is taught, right. um, it's not going to be taught in discussion sections per se. Um, and so really what we imagine with this book is, uh, uh, even in lecture, even a you know, professor giving a lecture, arguing with the book. Mm -hmm. So we get that, that discussion is, is going on, that the students, we, we make it uh, pretty small comparatively for an ancient history yeah. survey, which are often you know, five, six, seven hundred pages. So they can have time to go read a lot of the sources. And so it's, it's debate and argument all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, now, thankfully, that was not true of our experience together. Our experience together was very, <laughs> was, was very harmonious. Um, I think uh, in terms of kind of the collaboration on this, I'm trying to remember of um, interpretive, where some of the interpretive differences and issues might have come up a little bit in a, in a more, I know that of course, the earlier chapters on the, you know, the Bronze Age, you had a, there's much more uh, um, since you had it kind of reworking the whole framework of, of, of chapters and that type of thing, uh, which I think worked extremely well. But um, as far as, uh, kind of our collaboration and working together. It was, it was an extremely harmonious process. You know, that's, that's, yeah. that's my recollection of it. I'm trying to think of some interpretive issues that we might have struggled with for a little bit. And, there uh, weren't that many. There weren't that many. Um, I mean, there aren't that many you can have. But even so, we would gently say to each other, and I would say that's the key, civility. Uh, when I was reading something uh, and I disagreed with it, I would write back a very gentle note, I think you might want to consider to say it this way, rather than, I can't believe you were so stupid as to say this. You know, it's, you know, not that I ever thought that. But, <laughs> but, but really to say, you know, here's, there's an alternate way, maybe you might consider this or something like that. But, and that's the same in, in team teaching as well, not just team writing. But everybody's got their own opinions. The facts, there's only so much you can do with the facts. You really can't change what happened in antiquity. You can change your interpretation of it. And everybody has their own interpretation and they may well be welcome to it, but at least to be open to it. And that's gonna come up in class as well. Yeah. So my policy, for example, in class, whether I'm using my textbook or not, is, is never to say, no, you're wrong to a student. I would say, well, that's interesting. <laughs> not sure I agree with it, but it's interesting. And go on. And 
So I'm going to be using this textbook, as I do in most cases, to have a very discussion-based class. Uh, Greek history, Roman history, ancient world. You don't just have to throw the facts out at them, but to get them to talk about it, they're going to learn the facts along the way. Mm -hmm. And so I thought this was a really useful way to get at this. But again, you're going to have to be very civil in the class. Yeah. Right. Well, and anybody who's done team teaching, which is all of us, knows the importance of civility <laughs> um, in any kinds of, of meeting. Um, you talked about the difference, and thank you for bringing the book proposal. I didn't think to ask. That's great. Um, the difference between publishing this kind of work as opposed to publishing a monograph or as opposed to publishing your doctoral dissertation. Can you talk a little bit about those differences, about how it's different? Is it Carlos? I think Carlos mentioned data. Yeah. Right. This, this, is, this is a first, this is a first uh, type of point I had to go to. I had to find out very specifically to give it to, to, give to Cambridge, how many people are using this type? How many people teach an ancient history survey? So part of the, kind of the initial phase of the research really was getting out there. How many classes are there out there that could feasibly use this? What textbooks are they using? So it was just charts, you know, kind of just putting that together to say, here's what's actually happening in, in, the, uh, in the class. So uh, yeah, I'll admit, this is, I, I hate gathering data. So your, your point, I, I, yeah, that's one of the big things I'm taking away from that session earlier that's still coming through my mind, I hope comes back over and over again is uh, yeah, backing up what we say. You know, I could have told him anything about the usefulness. Uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this book is so important because, and as textbook, as a textbook division, you know, they would have cared, they, this, was, this would not have even, uh, it would have been rejected immediately. What they wanted to know, the data, the market, is this gonna be marketable? Uh, who's gonna buy it? And beyond just, of course, everyone has to fill out the marketing questionnaire for you know, a monograph. But here it was, uh, it was at, a, at a much higher level, pitched at a much higher level, and uh, they, they really wanted to know, yeah, who's, who, what, when, where, uh, do you have other colleagues who have expressed an interest in this? Who are they? Can we contact them to talk about? So it was, it was, a very, it was it's very market driven uh, in a way. I don't think that, uh, that it, not at the level that, uh, at least the, the first monograph I did was certainly not in this same level. So that, that was the first type of thing and um, yeah. But there's a great difference between books, types of books you're writing and the proposals. Each one obviously is different. But I would say there's a difference between turning your dissertation into a monograph. That's one scholarly mm -hmm. source. There's another writing textbook. There's yet another writing uh, books for a popularizing audience. Mm -hmm. And each of these are very different. And the proposals are very different. And the questions the editors and the marketing team ask are very different. And you have to justify them in very different ways. Uh, so, for example, the scholarly ones, they're not usually asking what's the market out there. They're asking if you've got a subvention to help them publish it. If you've got a... Subvention. Uh, if, can you give $5,000 towards the publication? <laughs> and then we're only going to publish 700 mm -hmm. and that's that. Uh, as opposed to uh, other ones where they say, well, how much of an advance do you want? Mm -hmm. And we can only publish 10000 Is that okay? You know? So it's mm -hmm. very, very different. But the questions they ask... Uh, then come down to, on the one hand, quite different, on the other hand, quite similar, uh, because in the end, they don't want to go broke. Right. And they also want to know that you're respected, that they're hiring somebody whose opinion matters, and that's going to do good research. So in all the different proposals, there are a couple of things that remain the same, mm -hmm. and yet they're each very different. So and I remember one where I turned in a proposal, and the editor said, with a kind of a sneer, we are not X press. <laughs> I won't name them, but they said, you need to up your writing. I said, really? Because I just dumbed it down from the other one. And they're like, no, we are not that press. And so it goes, you have to judge not only the ultimate audience, but the audience at the presses as to whether it's going to get accepted or not. And then you have to be willing to go with the flow. I mean, everybody has their job. And when they send it out to the reviewers, like they asked us for the names of three reviewers, got sent out. We still don't know who the reviewers were. Um, but it's the reviewer's job to come back being critical. And then it's our job to respond to the criticism in order to show that, yes, we respect what they have to say, but we're still convinced that we're right, and so we're going to go on that way. So everybody's got a role. And then it continues right through the writing. The editors and the copy editors are each getting paid to do a job, and you've got to respect that. And you can't get all high and mighty and say, my writing is sacrosanct, you can't touch it. Like, no, these editors are pretty good, and they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they might not be specialists in their field, but they've edited 50 other books. So go with it. 
be receptive. And you know what? It's probably going to make your book better, which it did. This is the perfect segue into my next question before we open it up, which is what advice would you have for other IHUM fellows or former IHUM fellows who were interested in doing this sort of collaborative writing, in coming together and, and working on producing something based on the experience of teaching? I'd, I'd say, I mean, at, a, at an obvious and basic level, to um, if, there, if you had a great experience with a, a team of fellows, uh, and maybe you haven't been in contact with them, and hopefully this very, uh, I'll say, setting is, is uh, facilitating that, uh, why not? Why, you know, I, you look at some of the, uh, the being there, I mean, I, when, uh, when I was here, there's a whole, you know, the different set of, of courses and all that. Why not get in contact with these, these uh, a group of the people and say, why not? Why, why can't we take that course that, we put, that, that uh, many people put a lot of thought and effort into? Mm -hmm. And it had its time at Stanford. That's mm -hmm. fine. It's not being taught anymore for whatever reason, faculty availability or whatever. And now, uh, you know, just let's, let's, get that, let's get that course, mm -hmm. that approach. Let's get that out there a little bit more broadly. So I would say that, that uh, the IHUM Fellows is really the first. I'd say that's the, really the obvious place that... Uh, that it's gonna gonna have to um, uh, to start there, and um, yeah, I would I would love to see that type of thing because I know we all put so much into mm -hmm. the discussions. I just got to hear last night about how much was put into IHM even before it, you know, as it was beginning with the conversations over the course of so many years and all of that. Uh, why not? Yeah, why why not take this type of thing out there? And um, one, I know. Let me just put one one fear that uh, uh, I don't know how much this applies to to, to many in here, but. Um, uh, when I started on this project, um, I did not have tenure. Mm -hmm. And uh, Beatrice Rell, she's the famous classical editor, editor of classics at Cambridge, uh, she called me and said, uh, you, know, are you, you, you realize that this particular book might not count for a tenure decision. And I had to explain to her a little bit about the nature of my institution. Mm -hmm. you know, I published a book, 50% of the faculty where I teach don't. You know, they define themselves as a teaching college. So that's not, that's not going to be an issue in my tenure mm -hmm. decision. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how much that applies to anyone else here, but um, I felt I had, a, I, I really did have a little bit more leeway because I wasn't getting the monograph out, first monograph from the dissertation, getting the next one out. Um, I really loved this project, and uh, so I, did, you know, I, I didn't want to have to be si going off on another research project at this time just for the sake of, of getting tenure. And so for me, that, I guess I, that was a little bit easier than, than I realized it's going to be in some programs where you can't just, you, of course, you can't just kind of thumb your nose at the whole tenure process at a, at, a, at a large research institution. You can't do it. And so maybe a team that has a combination of people in, in different types of backgrounds where you're, uh, people in a, maybe the small liberal arts college where I teach at might get the whole project going mm -hmm. um, and uh, be able to put you know, a good bit into the formative uh, side of this. Uh, whereas uh, somebody at uh, kind of going through the tenure process doesn't have the, the time uh, or the uh, you know just the time or the energy to be able to do all of that right then. So a collaborative project. I mean, Eric mentioned uh, it doesn't have to be 50-50. Uh, it doesn't have to be you know 60-40. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, that what was added to this book in readability. Again, Eric's being modest, saying 90% mine. I mean, he says it's readable. Uh, th thanks, Eric. I mean, it's readable. That's not me. I I'm trained to write in monograph, uh, you know, constipated style. But um, uh, that's um, so. Yeah, that I think a, a combination of, of different people, maybe on the same teaching team, different backgrounds, who can bring in uh, not just, we'll say, kind of the energy and expertise, but also there there are different places, different stages, and all of that. Uh, I, I think that'd be great to if, if more people could could take advantage out there. More people take advantage of the whole IHUM thing because so much has gone into that. And to see a course that's gone, right? It yeah. doesn't. Ha I mean, here's a course. I hope that's just going to keep on. Uh, you know, making the questions are still going to be there at the small colleges, at other colleges, and um, you know, that's maybe I'm sounding a little bit too much like an IHUM evangelist, perhaps. <laughs> but um, uh, at all events, uh, that's that's the type of thing I think is uh, that's exciting to me to see that. Right, so the idea is that we can take what we did here at Stanford and IHOM and disseminate it to the rest of the world because it worked pretty well here. And if it works well here, it should work pretty well everywhere else, and it's a, a new way of looking at it. So, uh, But yeah, some of the things that Mark said are, are very relevant, and not just to the tenure process. As you go along, I mean, I'm finding this right now, going up for full professor, they're now saying, what have you done? What was solo? What was co-authored? What's a textbook and what is you know, a monograph? And that's still, it resonates. It's not going to stop. Yeah. Right? And so you have to, but I've kind of done what you did, where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do the projects that I'm interested in, that I love, because that's where my passion is. And you know what? If you guys don't like, well, in that case, I'm in trouble. Because mm -hmm. right? they're like, sure, and what if you solo authored? I'm like, ooh. 
All right, so this is going to be something to keep in mind. On the other hand, working in collaboration really does work. And especially, they don't have to be. If you say you're writing a history textbook, one of your co-authors doesn't have to be a history person. Right? What, they can be an English person who is very good at writing. Because one thing that we've got, it's not just our profession, but others, where we're very good usually at writing for our peers and our right. colleagues. But I give it to my father, and he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Can't you write it so I'll understand it? And that's where bringing in a collaborator you can, can say, wow, now put what I've done into English so either my, you know, my grandmother can understand it or a student can understand it. Yeah. Right? And that's where it's very hard to do it yourself because you can't take a step back. Somebody else takes it and goes off and running. Right? And so we did that pretty well. And this children's author that I worked with, she did it extremely well because she's like, here's what you have to do to, for a 12-year-old. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, I, there's no way I could ever write like that. It's a special way to do it. Right. You mentioned the family connection. I'll just throw this out there real quick. Just before I came here, I was having a conversation with my parents mm -hmm. uh, who have never understood. I'm first generation uh, college uh, you know, in terms of going to college. My parents didn't go to college. My first monograph, they got three pages in, and you know, it's sort of like, what were you doing all of that time? I mean, they, they just, but then this one they read, and they said, yeah. you know, Mark, we, we understand what you're doing. And they said, now this inspires us to go back and read your first one, because we think we're going to understand a little bit more about how you think now. And so I, I think, you know, just in terms of that was sort of exciting across, across generations. Yeah. And if that can happen, you know, outside of that with others who might not have, uh, you know, not, might not be reading this type of thing, I think it's, uh, you know, can, can uh, be a segue into it. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much.